In this video on the periodic table, we're going to take a look at Nat Adam's position in the periodic table and learn something, hopefully, about some of the characteristics and properties that we can identify about it. One of the first things you can notice on the periodic table is a very bold zigzag line that starts at boron and zigzags its way down all the way to end up between polonium and astatine. This line separates the metals, which is everything to the left, from the non-metals, which is everything that we would find on the right of the zigzag line. Whether something is a metal or a non-metal actually tells us quite a bit of information about the element. Metals, for example, are mostly silver in color. The two exceptions are gold, which we know to be a yellow color, and copper, which is orange. Metals are typically shiny and are found in the state of a solid at room temperature. Again, an exception to a metal being found in the state of a solid would be mercury, which we know to be found as liquid. Metals are also good conductors of both heat and electricity. This is why metals get used in electrical wiring and why they are used in things like stoves or pans because they are good conductors of heat. Finally, metals are considered to be ductile, which means they can be stretched to form a wire and also malleable, which means that if I smash them with a hammer, I could actually pound them flat like a pancake. So if you were to randomly pick any element in the periodic table and it landed on the left hand side of the zigzag line without even ever knowing anything about the element you could say that it was probably a silver shiny solid that was a good conductor of heat and electricity and was both ductile and malleable. What kind of things could we say if we were to pick an element at random in the non-metal side of the periodic table? Well to start, nonmetals are typically brittle. But malleable and ductile, the best thing we could say is an opposite is brittle. While metals are good conductors of heat and electricity, nonmetals are the opposite. They tend to be insulators. Metals, we said, were solid, but nonmetals are going to more likely be gases. Some, of course, will still exist in the form of solids, but most will be in the form of gases, or if they're solids, they are brittle as opposed to being ductile and malleable. The one exception is bromine, which is found at room temperature as the form of a liquid. The elements touching the zigzag line are considered the metalloids. All elements that touch the zigzag line, with the exception of aluminum, are metalloids. Aluminum, we know to be a silver, shiny, ductile, malleable conductor of heat and electricity. Aluminum falls all the way to the metal side of the periodic table. The remaining elements are metalloids. Metalloids have some characteristics of each metals and nonmetals. They are often solids and they are often semiconductors. While they may be silver in color, like a metal, they are more often brittle, like a nonmetal. We may also notice that the periodic table is divided up into a large grid. Periods are the horizontal rows that we find on the periodic table. The first period has only two elements, elements in it, hydrogen and helium. Our second period starts here at lithium and beryllium and extends across the large gap to include boron all the way to neon. Period 3 starts with sodium. Period 4 is the first period that has no big gap in it. There are seven periods on the periodic table. The lanthanide and actinide series that you see below your periodic table actually fit right here in periods 6 and 7. 
They are usually removed and placed at the bottom, only to make more space on the periodic table. Our families are our vertical, vertical or up and down columns that we find on the periodic table. Our families are numbered, one being hydrogen, lithium all the way down, two, the family that starts with beryllium, three, four, five, six, seven, and the final one is eight. We have skipped the central section. These eight elements are called the group A, or representative elements. The ones that we find in the middle are called by group B, or transition elements. The families that we find on the periodic table in our representative elements, many of which have names. The alkali metal family, which was the first family that we noticed, that includes lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium, is the most reactive of all of my metal families. These metals react especially violently with water and air. In the comments below the video, in the explanation below the video, I will link a video that you can see reactions of the alkali metals in water. Family 2A is the alkaline earth metals. The alkaline earth metals are also reactive, but not as reactive as are the alkali metals. Families 3, 4, and 5 are not given special names. They are usually just called the boron, carbon, and nitrogen families. Family 6 has been given the name the Chalcogen family. Family 7 is the halogen family. The halogen family is the most reactive of our non-metal families. The halogens are, at the top, fluorine and chlorine gases at room temperature. Bromine is a liquid, and the larger ones, from iodine down to tennessee, will be found in the form of a solid. I have a video linked in the comments below the video that will show you a reaction between a member of the halogen family and a member of the alkali metal family. Finally, family 8 is called our noble gas family. The noble gas family is the least reactive of all of the families. The noble gas family is considered to be non-reactive with other elements in the periodic table. An element's position in the periodic table also tells us about the structure of the atom. Consider this square from the periodic table for the element carbon. We can see that C for carbon is the symbol for the element. All elements have names and a symbol. The symbol is the chemical shorthand. Symbols are always started with a capital letter and if further letters are required are in lower case. The number in the upper corner is your atomic number. The number in the bottom is your atomic mass. The atomic number tells us the number of protons that we find in the nucleus of the atom. The atomic mass tells us how many protons we have plus the amount of neutrons. Protons and neutrons are large heavy particles inside an atom. They are considered to have a mass of one atomic mass unit each. Electrons do not contribute to the mass of the atom. Electrons have, are considered to be without weight. From this information, we can determine the number of neutrons in an atom by taking the atomic mass and subtracting from that the atomic number. That will give us the number of neutrons in the atom. We determine the number of protons in an atom from the atomic number. The atomic number is the number of protons in an atom. It also tells us electrons because the number of protons in an atom is always equal to the number of electrons if it is a neutral atom. In grade 9 and 10, we drew Bohr diagrams. The general rule that we taught you in grade 9 and 10 was that two electrons go in the first string and the second and third rings can each hold a maximum of eight. To draw an atom, 
look for its position in the periodic table. For example, if I wanted to draw sodium, I will put the symbol Na in the center of the atom to represent the nucleus of sodium. You'll notice that sodium is in the third period on the th periodic table. This means that we will need three rings of electrons. It will save you a lot of space on your paper if we just draw arcs to represent the rings that we know, of course, goes all the way around the nucleus. In sodium, first ring, we can put as many as two electrons. Since sodium is at atomic number 11, we still need to add more. We then go to the second ring, which we can fill to a total of eight. We're at a total of 10 electrons so far. Sodium needs one more to make 11, but the second ring is full, so I put the third ring with one electron. To draw nitrogen, I put the symbol N inside the nucleus. And because nitrogen is in the second period of the periodic table, it needs two rings. I see nitrogen is at atomic number seven. It needs two electrons in the first ring and five more in the second. Lewis diagrams, we draw only the outer shell of electrons. So if I wanted the Lewis dot diagram for sodium, I put the symbol Na with one dot representing one valence electron. The valence is the outermost shell. So in the case of nitrogen, I will need five electrons. Working the way around the clock, you'll see one pair and three single electrons. I will link you to the lecture back in our grade 10 program that reviewed how to do Lewis dot diagrams. The easiest way to know how many valence electrons there will be is that it's always the same as the family number. So because sodium is in group 1, I will be able to know that it will always have one valence electron, as does any element in group 1. Nitrogen in group 5 will have 5. When we do Bohr diagrams at the grade 11 level, we can actually go past element 20, which we never did in grade 10. The fastest way to do a Bohr diagram for any element is to first note its position on the periodic table. For example, bromine is in the fourth period. Numbering my periods, elements 1 and 2, are in period 1, 2, 3, 4. I could have numbered this on the left or right, but in the interest of space, I put the number in closer to this one periodic table. That fourth period tells me that when I draw bromine, I will need four shells. So I will draw four arcs representing the four shells. Taking a look at the family number, bromine is in the seventh family. Because bromine's in the seventh family, I will expect to have seven electrons in this outer shell. I'm going to put this here as a little indicator, as a check for myself. Because bromine has 35 as the atomic number, I know that it will require 35 electrons in total. When I go to place the electrons on my diagram, the easiest way to do this is to count each square in order as they appear on the periodic table. The amount of squares is equivalent to the amount of electrons we'll find in that period and its corresponding ring. So in period one, ring one, I find elements one and two. So I will say that there are two electrons present. I'm still not pointing up rolling, so following the number in order, three and four are in the second ring, and then there's a big space. And then elements 5 through 10 are still in the second period. So we're going to put these remaining six electrons there as well. It is important that you separate the electrons that you count before the space from the ones you see after. Continuing along, period 3 is ring 3. There's two of them before the space. And then we have six more after. Going to period four, so ring four, there are two more electrons. And then we hit the central section. Anytime you count electrons corresponding to the transition elements, you must always back them up one level. 
So this next set of 10 squares does not stay in period 4, but instead backs up to period 3. Once I jump back into the regular representative section, I go back into my regular period, which we had earlier numbered as period 4. So they'll go back into ring 4. There are now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 more needed. So the last 5 electrons go back in ring 4. As expected, we have 7 electrons in my outer shell. We'll do one more example together. Let's do the element tin. Tin symbol is SN from its Latin name, stannin. Tin is in period 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So to draw tin, I know that I will need 5 rings. Tin is in family number 1, 2, skip the ones in the middle, 3, 4. So I know I'm going to expect to find 4 electrons in this final ring. And because tin is at atomic number 50, I know I will need 50 electrons. Counting each square in order as they are numbered. 1 and 2, 2 squares, goes into ring 1 because it's period 1. In ring 2, there are 2 before the break, and then 6 more after. Again, remember to separate those electrons. In ring 3, there are 2 before the break, six more after. Continuing in order, ring four has two of them before the transitions. Remembering that this next set of 10 squares for 10 electrons will back up one level from what we would expect. So even though it looks like we're in the fourth period, we're actually putting them back into the third. When I continue with the electrons corresponding to numbers 31 to 36, these go back where I'd expect them to, in ring 4. We're still not at 10, so we go to ring 5 for 2. We then count 10 more squares, which I back up and put into ring 4. Jumping back into ring 5, I need 2 more until I've pointed at 10. And you will notice we have now got this adding up to 50 electrons, and as expected, there are 4 electrons in the outer shell. This method of counting the squares on the periodic table and understanding that each square corresponds with one extra electron is a much faster way for us to draw the Bohr structures for any element found on the periodic table. If you were to count any elements that involve the lanthanide and actinide series, you would back these ones up two levels. But we won't be going to that point in grade 11. In this video, we have hopefully helped you to identify whether elements are metals, nonmetals, or metalloids, and hopefully you could use the characteristics that I've indicated to describe them to some degree. That you understand the difference between a period and a family, and you can name the major families. That you know how periods and families help you to predict how many electrons you're going to have in the outer ring and how many rings of electrons you'll need and that you're able to draw Lewis and Bohr diagrams. In your green work packages, on page 5, there is a short little assignment designed to help you practice finding elements on the periodic table and recognizing some of the characteristics and properties above them. It will also help you to get used to the names and symbols for elements on the periodic table.